Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, doing part two of our mini series on the commands from the Shepherd of Hermas. If you have missed part one, I would suggest you go over and look at that video. We've covered two commands in that first video. And we went in and did a little bit of introduction as far as what this book is, talking about the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, so we're going to skip most of that. However, I did want to show you um, something over here at the blueletterbible.com. Um, this is a well-trusted website. And I wanted to show you what it said about uh, the Shepherd of Hermas and how it is actually supposed to be part of the Canaan. It seems to be a pretty good website on the subject. I haven't read it all, um, but it seems to be given details on a lot of books, like uh, letters of Barnabas and even the letters from Clement, showing you know reasons or how they were part of the Canaan at one time, giving a little bit of history on those books of relationships in the Canaan. And we see that the Shepherd of Hermas was included in the Canaan as well. Um, looks like it was part of the Canaan even up until about the 15th century. Um, a century before the Bible actually came out in English, where we have the current Canaan, um, it was a, considered a Canaanized book. So those popes, sometimes those, you know, Catholic authorities, sometime between the 1500s and the 1600s, decided to leave it out of the, uh, the Canaan. That's why, you know, many people don't recognize the Shepherd of Hermas as being part of the Bible. However, in my opinion, it is probably the most important book that was left out of the Bible. Turns out there were many, many books that the, the uh, Catholic uh, um, authorities decided to leave out of the Bible for one reason or the, or the other. These, you know, are scriptural writings. You know, I don't see, you know, how they thought it, you know, themselves as being so um, important on the subject, for lack of a better word, that they could actually decide which ones of our father's words we would read and which ones we wouldn't read. But that's actually what they did. But anyway. We're looking at in the Shepherd of Hermas. Now, in part one, you've missed uh, chapter one, which was on believing that there is one God. And the last thing he said, as far as that was concerned, if we obey the commands of believing that there is one God, that we would live unto God. Live unto the Father, meaning that we would um, survive the tribulation. We're going to find out later. And I do, you know, want to, you know, bring that out as far as you guys who are watching this video. If you look at the number of people who have viewed these type of videos compared to the other videos, you know, that talk about the rapture or talk about the third temple. You notice that the view count is not as high. And, you know, it's a reason for that. You know, the way I read the scripture, only two million people is actually going to be alive when we get to the other side of the tribulation, when we enter the kingdom of heaven. There will only be two million people alive, you know. So the way I calculated it, that's about one in 3,500 people will survive till then. So when you, you know, you look at some videos and there's a lot of people interested in the mark of the beast, there's a lot of people interested in the rapture, there's a lot of people interested in, um, you know, those kind of things, but not many people are actually interested in what it takes to survive the tribulation. Like I said, one out of 3,500, 3,700 people, you know, one out of 3,700 people. Um, I did the calculation here in my entire county, that would mean only five people would survive in my entire county, you know, but, you know, that's better than, you know, my wife said, you know, that's not a lot of people, but, you know, that's better than it was back in the days of Noah. Back in the days of Noah, there was eight people in the entire world that survived, eight people in this entire world that survived, you know, so this time I believe we're looking at about two million based on what I read in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. You know, so you should consider yourself blessed that the Father has put it on your heart to, you know, understand the Shepherd of Hermas. Because, you know, like we said, this information is necessary to survive of the tribulation. You know, whether you get it intuitively, whether you get this information by way of these classes, or whether you read that book for yourself, one way or the other, if you don't understand the principles taught in the Shepherd of Hermas, you do not have a chance of surviving the tribulation. You're going to die before the end of the tribulation. You know, we have to get this stuff. Um, like we talked about in the first class, uh, avoiding detraction and alms deeds. Well, you know, we went into detail in that class. And like I said, you can go over and look at that, you know, but it's real easy to see when real easy to understand that when we are slandering people, you know, during the tribulation, that kind of stuff is going to get you killed. And, you know, doing charitable deeds during the tribulation or during the apocalypse will aid in your survival. You know, as you know, in the rest of these commands we're going to learn here um, as well is necessary for the survival of the tribulation. This command here, um, these commands down here, the last thing it said about them was um, when we do these commands, that our repentance will be found sincere and that good may come to our house and have a pure heart. So those things, like I keep using this word necessary, means that it has to be done. These are necessary to the survival of the apocalypse and the tribulation. Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about um, where we're going to start here at command three. And it says of avoiding lying. And the repentance of Hermas for his dissimulation, All right? And if we see that word in the text, we'll actually look it up. All right, so let's get started. First one says, moreover, he said unto me, love truth and let all the speech be true 
which proceeds out of thy mouth. Okay, now, one thing you notice about these commands is the level of detail that they go in, whereas the Old Testament simply said, you know, bear no false witness, which, you know, one could actually debate that, that act, that's not actually saying don't lie. Um, to bear false witness means to, like, accuse somebody of doing something when, you know, you really didn't notice them doing it. So it's not really, you know, talking about lying, whereas this one is actually talking about lying. This, 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 this command is, is more about lying. Verse 2 says that the spirit which the Lord has given to dwell in thy flesh may be found true towards all men. And the Lord be glorified who has given such a spirit unto thee because God is true in all his words and in him there is no lie. Now notice this part right here how it is talking about us as being fleshly beings and it is also talking about us as being spiritual beings. Now I believe we've always understood this inherently that we were spiritual beings. I know I have you know even back when, when I was a child and I would think about what happens to a person after they die. At no time do I ever remember thinking that it's just going to be lights out. That's it. There's nothing else. It was like I always knew that there was something else in there that would actually live on after I died. Maybe I got it from the cartoons when it was show you a picture of that spirit that would be leaving that cartoon body when it dies. Well, this is actually a fact. We have a spirit being inside of us. Here it is still before what we call the Great Awakening. So we haven't came in contact with that spirit in the form and, and that we can, you know, recognize who it is. You know, the spirit has lived many lifetimes down here on the earth and we have no way of remembering those lifetimes before the Great Awakening. Apparently, you know, according to the scripture, I should say, after the Great Awakening, we will be able to recognize our spirit man. There's a part in the, in the scripture that talks about how People will walk up to a gravesite. You'll have a child who will walk up to a gravesite that's, you know, been there for, you know, a long time, 100 years. And he'll point to that gravesite and he'll say that that is me. That's me. That's buried there. You know, that, you know, here it is, a six-year-old, 12-year-old kid talking about, you know, 12-year-old girl talking about how she used to be a 75-year-old man that died, you know, 15 years ago or something like that. So we, we have that to look forward to. But notice here how it is talking about lying has an effect on our spirit. It says, the spirit which the Lord has given thee to, to dwell in our flesh may be found true towards all men. So, and I believe it's going to expound on this a little bit, is that when we are lying in our flesh, we're actually causing our spirit to lie too. It's like we're... We, we are harming our spirit, even though we don't know who this guy is inside of us. We're actually, you know, making him or turning them into a liar. Let's, let's go on. I believe it says it plainly here. Verse 3 says, They therefore that lie deny the Lord and become robbers of the Lord, not rendering to God what they received from him. So we got this spirit from our father. He is the father of our spirit. That's what the word father means. That's why the scripture tells you to call no man father. Because when you say father, you're talking about the, 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 the creator of your spirit. Just like your daddy is the creator of your flesh. You know, him and your mama got together and they created your flesh. That's your daddy. Well, your father got together with, I don't, well, I probably shouldn't have started that sentence. But your father is who created your spirit, man. He is the father of your spirit, man. And when he created us, you know, he created us pure. He created us like him. We was in the image of him. But when we tell lies, we actually tarnish that spirit. What it says, and become robbers of God, not rendering to God what they have received from him. Because, see, our spirit eventually has to go back to where it came from. You know, I said whole alpha and omega thing. We started off in the alpha. We started off with the father. And we're going to end up in the omega. We're going to end up in the father. But, you know, he gave us, you know, this spirit uh, clean and pure. Like it was a new car or something. And now by lying, we've dirtied it up and trashed it up. And now then we're going to then give it back to him in that, you know, deteriorated condition. You know, and that's what it's talking about when he's saying that we're, we're robbing God by lying. Verse four says, for they receive the spirit free from lying. If therefore they make that a liar, they defile what was committed to them by the Lord and become deceivers. So you think of the times when we may have thought we have just been telling a little white lie or, you know, something nobody ever caught. You know, no, that stain has now been placed on our spirit and our father in heaven sees that stain. Nobody else may see it, but he sees it. You know, we have defiled our spirit. And, you know, that's, that's the scripture talks about the hour of the conscious. It's part of that great awakening that, you know, we humanity has to go through where, you know, our conscious is going to become dominant in our life. Well, you can imagine that's going to be a big part of it is when now we have to face all of the lies that we have ever told in our life. And, that, you know, that's where repentance comes in at, guys. Um, repentance goes a long way. If we can somehow remember the lies that we have told in our life and, you know, repent of those lies, then we don't have to suffer so much for them. You know, we don't have to make them up through pain if we can repent ahead of time. Verse 5 says, when I heard this, I wept bitterly. And when he saw me weeping, he said unto me, why weepest thou? And I said, because, sir, I doubt whether I can be saved. So here it is, Hermes. Like I said, we all are this Hermes figure. We need to see ourselves like this Hermes figure. And, you know, here we are thinking about all of the lies that we're told all about all the way back to when we were children. You know, you know, plenty, 
told plenty of lies, especially when we were kids. And we knew that, you know, we would get, get our whipping for telling the truth. You know, it's like our parents beat the truth out of us. Every time we told the truth, we got a spanking. And so, but now those things are still on our spirit. How is it that we are going to be saved? And, you know, and so there's Herman's like, you know, I can't make up for that. You know, like we just talked about repenting. There's, there's no way you're going to remember every lie that you've ever told in your entire life. You can try. It'll probably be a good idea to try it, but you're not going to be a hundred percent. So, you know, what's the deal? He asked me, wherefore, I replied, because, sir, I never spake a true word in my life, but always lived in dissimulation and affirmed the life for truth to all men. And no man contradicted me, but all gave credit to my words. How then can I live seeing I have done in this manner? Yeah, so he's just saying that, you know, truth has it been a big part of his life. You know, and, and, and it's for a lot of us, you know, sure, you know, we tell the truth when it's convenient, you know, but when it was not convenient for us to tell the truth, many of us just told a lie, you know, uh, you know, like, cop says, was you speeding or the judge says, were you speeding? And like, no, I mean, we just thought it was in, in the best interest not to tell the truth in that moment. And we didn't consider the fact that we were um, adding these things to our spirit. All right. So we said we were going to look up the word dissimulation. Um, uh, to dissimulate, is a, as a verb says, to hide under false appearance. So to be deceptive or to lie or, you know, something to that effect. Let's go back over here and see it. Uh, used in a sentence. I guess it'll take its own little time. Or maybe it's going to take some of my time too. And it says, but always lived in dissimulation. So he's always lived in this kind of falsehood um, and affirmed the life of the truth to all men. So whenever somebody lied in his presence, you know, he, he agreed with them. You know, it, it makes it off like he was some kind of a businessman. And, you know, when it, it was convenient for him to tell a lie to make a dollar or whatever, he did so. And he says, no man contradicted me, but all gave credit to my words. Um, and how can I live seeing it have done in this manner? And so, you know, this this is this is a good way to be recognizing that we have done wrong in our lifetimes and then trying to understand what it is that we need to do going forward. And he's talking to the right guy here. Verse seven says, and he said unto me, thou thinkest well and truly for thou oughtest as the servant of God to have walked in the truth and not have joined an evil conscience with the spirit of truth, nor have grieved the holy and true spirit of God. So like we said, we talk, he's talking to the angel of repentance. I remind you guys who this angel of repentance is. He's the angel. Um, I think it's Uriah. I want to say it's Uriah. I have to look that up. But he is is over all of the repentance of humanity. You have different angels with different responsibilities. Like you have Michael, who is kind of the lawgiver. He is known as the covenant angel. He protects those who keeps the law. You have Gabriel, who's kind of uh, over, you know, our psyche or our mental state. He's the one that gives us dreams. If we ever want to um, um, have dreams, you know, we would ask, you know, our father in heaven to send Michael to, you know, visit us to, you know, give us a dream or to help us to understand a dream. Well, you also have the angel of repentance. He's over all of the repentance. Anybody who has a repentant heart is in, has been touched by this particular angel. Anybody who, you know, and there's a lot of people who repentance is in no way part of their life. It's, you know, it's because they haven't been awarded the opportunity to repent, to repent. You know, you get that from our father. And, you know, if he doesn't send this angel that would put it on your heart to be repentant, you know, you won't. You know, and, you know, there's some people with an asparagus um, repentance, meaning that repentance is not serious. And, you know, the father recognizes that even before they get started and he doesn't allow them to repent. You know, that's why there's so many lawless people in the world is because, you know, there's no need in allowing them to repent because, you know, they're going to repent of repenting, you know, in just a short time. But you know, let's see what else does it say here. He says, for thou artist as the servant of God to have walked in truth and not to have joined an evil conscience with the spirit of truth. So we have the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is like the comforter. Uh, that's what we hear about, you know, um, in I think it's Luke 22. It talks about the comforter. I think it's Luke 22. Um, maybe John 22, something like that. But. Um, but we, but this is um, a spirit that we're promised. A comforting spirit is something that's promised to promised to us in the end times. But we always have a conscious. Thing is, they actually dwell in the same neighborhood. They live in you know in in our hearts somewhere. Both the conscious and the spirit and truth. Spirit of truth are in there together. And that's what he's talking about. Where we join the the um, the the conscious, evil conscious, this lying conscious to the spirit of truth. We mix them. We mix those two things together. All right. Verse eight says, and I replied unto him, Sir, I never before hearkened so diligently to these things. He answered, now thou hearest them, take care from henceforth that even those things which thou hast formerly spoken falsely for the sake of thy business may, by thy present truth, receive credit. Okay, now notice this part. This is probably the most important part of this lesson about lying. You know, we I believe it's real easy for us to, to know that, you know, lying is wrong, you know, and, and, you know, we shouldn't have been doing that. But notice how he tells Hermes, just stop lying. He doesn't tell Hermes to go and make up for the lies that he's already told. Remember, Hermes was just now crying a second ago, talking about how was he, you know, going to be saved, having, you know, done all of this lying that he's done in his entire life. 
And the answer that he's receiving is to not tell any more lies. Stop lying from today going forward, you know. And uh, this is really important for us to understand, you know, you know, because, you know, we start to think like Hermes did that, you know, we need to go and make up for it. You know, I lied to my mama back when I was 15 years old. She asked me that question. No, no, you don't. That's not what he's saying to do there. You don't need to call your mama up, you know, say, you know, I lied to you. It's just that, you know, if ever, if you ever, if she ever asks you again, if you ever given the opportunity to, to tell the truth, then you tell the truth from now on and going forward. Verse 9 says, for even those things may be credited, if for the time to come thou shalt speak the truth, and by so doing thou mayest attain unto life. Now, here we are, like I said, this, this book is very spiritual, you know, and he's talking about how even the things that you've misspoken about before will receive credit if you tell the truth going forward, you know, and, you know. As a minister, we always try to, you know, speak truth. You know, we understand that we are held, you know, to a higher standard, you know, and, you know, even things that we misspeak in error, we will, you know, be held accountable for those. So we try to do a good job of always telling the truth. Every minister out there, you know, some make more mistakes than others, but because we recognize that we're going to be punished for every misword that we spoke, most of us try to do a good, really good job of speaking truth, but yet we still make errors. And, but you look at this verse in light of all of that, where it's saying that you add credibility to the things that you have misspoken if you tell the truth going forward. And that's why, you know, you guys, you'll notice that in that, you know, some of the stuff I talk about can be a little bit fluid. Like if you go back and you listen to a video that I created in 2014, when I was still, you know, when I had a, a you know, before I knew about the third testament of the Bible and before I gotten, you know, a lot of understandings I have now, I was still, you know, I had a different understanding of the whole rapture scenario back then. And, you know, when you listen to that stuff and, you know, Somebody who, you know, not really aware of coaching the fight, you know, be like, hey, he misspoke right there. But you notice in my videos, you know, now I don't go back and erase them videos um, from way back then. It's just that now, you know, when I'm doing videos, I make sure that, you know, I repeat the, the truth twice now to kind of one time to tell the truth now and one time to kind of make up for, you know, something that I misspoke, making sure that everybody understand what the truth is, you know. And that's what he's telling Hermes to do here. He's saying that you will get credit. I get credit for, you know, those videos even back then because I am, you know, intentionally, you know, making sure that I make the truth known as of now. I think it's also important for you guys to understand that, you know, this journey is a bit of an evolution as far as the truth is concerned. You know, none of us, you know, started our ministry out knowing every day, you know, a bunch of us like myself included still don't know every day and we're still learning every day. And, you know, sometimes it adds to our credibility when you can go back in an old video and say, you know, I believe I used to believe what you believe now, you know, you ain't like I, you know, just, you know, landed here and, you know, start talking, you know, about these things in this manner. No, I used to stand over there where you're at and I used to say the same words. It's just that I have learned since then so you know but anyway notice this part right here where it says by doing by so doing thou mayest attain into life so every one of these commands has it, it, it gives you the details on you know what it means to obey these commands and then it gives you um you know it even tells you what the benefits are kind of like the book of revelation chapter two and three where you know at the end of every one of those churches it says for those who overcome this will happen and that will happen well it's saying this one if you if you can overcome the lying spirit it says you may attain unto life and again remember this life that we're talking about is actually living through the tribulation this is you know the goal of many of the people that's watching this video we want to be part of those you know those you know few million people like i said probably two million people that's actually going to go over and you know be the knowers of the new world um, um to repopulate the earth Anyway, verse 10 says, and whosoever shall hearken unto these commands and do it shall depart from all lying and shall live unto God. So now I guess this is this is this is the benefit which we're going to live unto God. And again, he's going to tell us here in um, one of these commands. I can't remember which one it is. Hermes is going to come flat out and say, why do you keep saying this live unto God thing? Um, we saw that back over here in. Uh, uh, command one, which command one was believing that there is one God. And he says, and put on righteousness and thou shalt live unto God if thou shalt keep this commandment. And we're seeing this one over here about lying that, you know, if we depart from all lying, we shall live unto God. All right. So let's go on. We're now in chapter four of the second book of Hermes called his commands. And this command is on putting away one's wife for adultery. Now, before we get into this, um, one thing that, you know, I'll say is <clears throat> how this Hermes figure is is the male part. And, you know, usually when we think of adultery in the manner that he's going to talk about here, we always think of it from the woman's perspective. You know, and this one is talking about the adultery of, Herm of um, Hermes's wife. Um, we usually think of the man who actually does this kind of stuff. And I think it's done this way for our benefit when we're looking for it looking at it from a different angle, I think it kind of is going to help us to, to, to get an understanding of what it is, ex what we are expected to do if we find ourselves in at this moment. So uh, let me just go on. You'll see what I'm talking about in a second. 
<laughs> Verse 1. Furthermore, he says, I command thee that thou keep thyself chaste and that thou suffer not any thought of any other marriage or fornication to enter into thy heart. For such a thought produces great sin. Now, notice first of all, he starts talking about thoughts. You know, he ain't necessarily saying go do that thing. He said, don't even think about it. You know, don't, you're going to talk to him. You know, it's a big part of this discussion, how our thoughts will lead to actions. We have to learn to control our thoughts. That's a big part of, you know, where we're at in our spiritual evolution is controlling our thoughts. You know, there, there used to be a time when we couldn't control our bodies. You know, we'd run, on, we'd run down there to where that lady was at, run down there to where that man was at. And, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd do the act physically. We've matured past that point, and now it is our thoughts that we need to get a hold of, you know, to to you know go on to the next level or whatever. Um, he says, "Suffer not any thought of any other marriage or fornication." Now, now he, he may not necessarily be talking about man's form of marriage, or maybe talking too much in these videos. But you, when when the Bible talks about you know marriage, when the Bible speaks on marriage, it's when that that man or that woman, I almost want to say that, that child, because, you know, some of these people are 18, 17 years old. When they consummate that marriage or when they, you know, get together in such a way, they're actually considered husband and wife, even though there's no piece of paper involved. You know, uh, biblical marriage is quick. Let me just put it like that. A biblical marriage is, is really, really quick, if you know, if you, if you understand what I'm talking about. But anyway, he says, so, you know, simply talking about or thinking about, you know, fornicating is actually thinking about another marriage. You're actually thinking about taking on another wife if you're actually thinking about committing adultery. You're like, I didn't plan on going down to the courthouse. Well, you know, that's man's stuff. That's man's law. You know, ain't got you know, ain't no marriage licenses in the Bible. Not one marriage license. Nobody in the whole Bible ever got a marriage license. Not one. Um, to enter into that heart for such a thought produces great sin. The thoughts commit sin. And that's one thing we need to understand is that we will be held accountable for the thoughts that we have. Um. Um, this is kind of new to our understanding of things. We weren't really taught that in church. You know, we were taught that we, you know, it was the acts that we would you know, have to pay for. Nobody ever explained to us that we have to pay for our thoughts too. We will be held accountable for our thoughts. Like we were talking about a, a little earlier about the um, hour of the conscience and how we will, you know, be held accountable for the lies. Well, we're going to be held accountable for the thoughts too. So we need to, you know, get in that repentant heart about even the thoughts that we have had. But let's go on. He says, but be thou at all times mindful of the Lord and thou shalt never sin. For if such an evil thought should arise in thy heart, thou shouldest be guilty of a great sin. And they who do such things follow the way of death. Now, there's a lot to unpack in this, in this verse here. Notice the first part where he says, be thou at all times mindful of the Lord. So this, so this is telling us how it is that we are to control our thoughts when it comes to adultery. But it applies to every wicked thought. You know, if we start, start thinking negatively towards somebody, you know, we have to control our thoughts at all times. Well, one of the things that we'll learn to do in the Shepherd of Hermes is that you have to kind of get ahead of it. When you start to see um, that spirit of inequity start to come in, when you start having that first thought about adultery, you you don't let it grow. You don't let it fester. You stop. And he's telling you right here to start thinking about the Lord. And he's going to tell us in a second to put our minds on our own wife, you know, and think about her in that moment. And it works. You know, like I said, I've, I've had to grow through, you know, all of this stuff. You know, I was on the other side of Hermes, you know, coming into this thing. And, you know, so I had to learn a lot of this stuff the hard way. And it, it, what, he, what he's telling us here actually works. You know, if you ever have a wicked thought, you know, as far as uh, uh, another you know, woman or another man for you ladies is concerned, um, you immediately start thinking on the Lord and start thinking on your wife. Keep your eyes on your own paper kind of deal. And, you know, those other thoughts, they'll just disappear. They'll melt away. Um, it says, for if such an evil thought should arise in our heart, thou shouldest be guilty of a great sin. So, you know, if we're allowed to entertain that thought we're actually going to be held accountable for it there's coming a day when even that thought is going to haunt us you know as we face our conscience it's going to bear down on us that we've even had that thought that's what that's what our conscience is going to do is it's going to remind us of even the thoughts that we had to allow us to be repentant of those uh wicked thoughts you know so that we can um um be purified of that demon and not have to worry about those going into the kingdom of heaven anybody that can't control their thoughts is not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven like we said this book is necessary we have to get these points if we want to survive you know even those who go off into the spirit world you know you know before or they, they can't, they, they're still going to learn. They're just going to learn it in the spirit world. They, they're still going to get it, you know, one way or the other. We're going to we're going to get these points. We just rather get them in the flesh. I know. I think I would. Anyway, he says, and thou shalt be guilty of great sin, and they who do such things uh, follow the way of death, meaning it's going to kill us. Sin, you know, creates death. You know. Um, anyway, let's go. On. Verse three says, look therefore to thyself and keep thyself from such a thought. For where chastity remains in the heart of a righteous man, there an evil thought ought never to arise. You know, so, you know, we have to work on this, you know, and it gets better. You know, some of you guys, this is the first time you're hearing about how your thoughts are going to get you in trouble. And, you know, you're, you're wanting to start correcting that and you, you do well to want to start to control your thoughts. Well, it gets better. You know, the more you increase, you know, spirit, the more you evolve spiritually and get better at this, the easier it's going to be to keep your mind chaste. And so you have to work on it every day. 
because what is it says uh the heart of a righteous man there an evil thought ought never to arise verse 4 says and i said unto him sir suffer me to speak a little to you he bade me say on and i answered sir if a man that is faithful in the lord shall have a wife and shall catch her in adultery thus a man sin that continues to live still with her so now this is like like we was talking about earlier usually the, the roles are reversed where you have the woman who has recognized her husband in an adulterous type relationship and is questioning does she does she um is she guilty or is he guilty if he remains to live with her Let's see what the angel has to say now. We have to pay close attention to you know what's going on here because you know this is this is some deep stuff and we have to remember that all of the father's rules apply. You know you, know, you, you remember the rules of the Old Testament. Some of you guys who know those rules concerning this subject in the Old Testament, you know there is no conflict here. Let me just say that from the jump. It may seem like it, but the more you think about it, the more you'll realize that you know it's really about repentance. So here you have Hermes who who has what do you say? Shall catch her? So he didn't caught her in adultery. Does the man sin that continues to still live with her? Now, we have to pay close attention to those words there. Like we said, and the reason why I bring this up is that, you know, somebody um, almost thought they had identified a contradiction there, you know, because um, he caught her in adultery and he's still living with her. And this was part of the problem that the Catholic Church had with this scripture is, you know, but, you know, it doesn't. It just says the word live with her, still live with her. We just leave it at that. It, it didn't. No, let's not add any other words there. It says still. It says live still with her. Anyway. You should know what I'm talking about. Verse five says, and he said unto me, as long as he is ignorant of her sin, he commits no fault in living with her. But if a man shall know his wife to have offended and she shall not repent of her sin, but go on still in her fornication and a man shall continue nevertheless to live with her, he shall become guilty of her sin and partake with her in her adultery. So now here's a lesson. We probably can do a whole class on this, this verse right here. Now, if he or she doesn't know that her spouse is actually, you know, doing this thing, then she has no guilt whatsoever. He has no guilt whatsoever, as long as he is unaware of it. But then it says, but if a man shall know his wife to have offended, and so he knows that she didn't did this thing. Now, we got to pay close attention here because it's, it's, a, it's a really important lesson. And she shall not repent. So she, he knows she didn't did it. And here's the first scenario is that she is not repenting of it. She's like, I'm still going to do it. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to stop. You know, it wasn't a mistake in the first place. And, you know, I'm not going to try to correct it because it wasn't a mistake. I'm going to continue to do it. And so she shall not repent of her sin, but go on still in her fornication. And a man shall continue nevertheless to live with her. He shall become guilty of her sin. And like we said, this is, this works both ways. I think it is put here with, you know, Hermes, you know, and, you know, so we can all get an idea of what's going on here. Usually it's the roles are reversed, but you know, so when that woman, if she knows of her husband has committed adultery and he is continuing to to commit adultery, then she becomes partaker in the sin. If he knows that she's, if she knows that he's going off and doing this thing, she is actually becoming partaker in that adultery that he's doing. It says he shall be guilty of her sin and partake with her in the adultery. All right, let's, let's go on. She's not finished yet. Verse six says, and I said unto him, what therefore is to be done if the woman continues in her sin? He answered, let her husband put her away and let him continue by himself. But if he shall put away his wife and marry another, he also does commit adultery. Now, we got some of this going on in our neighborhood. And I think this is why I've spent so much time thinking about this. And the roles are reversed, of course. And you have the uh, woman who, you know, she's put away her husband. She's put away her husband. You know, the thing about it is it, it, he didn't fit the first category. You know, he had got caught in the act. He had got caught in the act of committing adultery. He actually um, made a girl pregnant. And, you know, the wife found out about it when, of course, the lady came and said, you know, I'm having your husband's child and all of that drama. But by then, the relationship between the husband and the, I'm going to call her, I don't know what else to call her, the the, um, the second lady that I want to call her concubine, but the, the second woman, second wife, um, the relationship between them were over. It was kind of like a, what they would call a one-time thing or a short-time thing, but, you know, it had lasting results. So here it is months later, and, you know, this woman has, you know, this relationship with this one woman has now turned into a relationship with two people because she is now with the child. So according to what we're understanding here, the first wife, understanding that that husband was no longer in that relationship, I don't think we got into that part what she was actually supposed to do, but he was no longer in that relationship. So her actions would have been different than if he were actually still in the relationship. So what she ended up doing was putting him away. And so now you have three single people, you know, he's single because, you know, he's not with the first wife and he's not with the second wife, the one that's newly pregnant. The woman that's, you know, with child, she's not with him. And apparently she hadn't found anybody else. And then you have the first wife who, you know, is separated from the husband. So you have these, um, 
three single people. And then shortly after that, the next thing we hear is that the first wife is now dating somebody else, you know? And, and so you have what's going on here where it's talking about, but if he shall put away his wife and marry another, he does commit adultery. So now <laughs> she is actually the one in the wrong, <laughs> not the husband. They got the lady pregnant, not the lady that got pregnant, but the woman who now has put away her husband and is now in a relationship with somebody else is the guilty one in all of this big mess. That's why I'm spending so much time on this because it goes on. You know, it was a big deal down at the church, actually, where, you know, it was primarily the church members who encouraged her to get rid of her husband in the first place. You know, they told her to, to separate from him. It was kind of like they, they talked him, they talked her into actually, you know, putting him, making him leave, making, putting him out of the house or whatever. And then when she, you know, got involved with somebody else, you know, they didn't do their due diligence to go in and try to correct her in that they actually almost you know encouraged her to have this relationship with this other guy you know you know but it was actually putting her in an adulterous state she became an adulterer at that point verse 7 says and i said what if the woman that is so put away shall repent and be willing to return to her husband shall she not be received by him he said unto me yes and if her husband shall not receive her he will sin and commit a great offense against himself but he ought to receive the offender if she repents, only not often. So here you got this little lady. We can talk about this story here. So we can finish it up. You got this lady who, um, the first wife, found out that her husband had had some extramarital affairs. But the husband, like we said, wasn't still involved with the first lady. Um, I'm going to assume that he, you know, recognized his guilt and was like, you know, that's over with. I'm no longer with her. According to what we read here, it was the first wife's responsibility to bring that man back into the house. He was supposed to come back. She wasn't supposed to end that relationship, which is still ended. You know, they, they live in two different states now and she's got the two boys and the husband, you know, he's going off. I don't know if they got the divorce settled or whatever, but this is what we're talking about here. You know, you have this man who has committed this act and he's now repentant of it. It is the first wife's responsibility to take this man back, according to what we read here. And by not doing that, she, what does it says? Um, and uh, if her husband shall not receive her, he will commit a great offense against himself. So she committed a great offense against herself by not allowing her husband to repent. He ought to receive the offender if she repents, only not often. So, you know, apparently this was a one-time thing. You know, at least it was the first time. She should have, you know, brought him back in. Now, if he went off and did it again, of course, the story changes then. You know, it doesn't fit what we're reading here in the scripture. It changes. Now, of course, I you know, would pray that none of you guys would actually find yourself in this situation, but I would actually hope that you would find yourself as counselors in this situation. We are actually in error when we tell these young ladies to separate from their husband. I mean, this kind of stuff goes on all the time. You know, you know, back in the old days, people, would, men, men waited today was 130 years old before they got married. Now they're getting married, you know, at 16, 17, 18 years old. They're still kids and they still make these chap immature mistakes. And the first thing we tell them is, oh, I wouldn't take that. If I was you, I would leave him and all of that kind of stuff. No, that, you know, that's not scriptural. That's not biblical. We're actually tearing these families up, you know, because of this stuff. You know, he should let that man pay for that mistake, really. You know, browbeat him, you know, punish him, whip him if you need to. But, you know, give him the opportunity to repent, you know, and then, you know, go on from there. Don't, don't ruin his life. And you can see here that, you know, you can see that, you know, the one who doesn't receive the offender commits a great sin, too. So she's, she's you know, both parties' lives are being ruined here. The only one person that benefits is this, is the woman who, you know, got pregnant because now she gets the opportunity to get this husband. And if you didn't separate it from that husband, you know, now she got a shot. She usually takes that shot. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 8 says, For to the servants of God, there is but one repentance. And for this cause, a man that putteth away his wife ought not to take another because she may repent. So now this is what this is all about. You know, it's really not about the adultery part. It's so much as it is about the repentant part and how it is that the offender, the, the repentant heart has to be forgiven. This is a commandment. You know, whatever the offense is, it don't have to be adultery. It could be anything. Somebody steal from you, you know, whatever the case may be, if they are repentant, you have to allow the person to repent. You know, this is part of the Lord's prayer when it says we forgive, you know, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our, our, our debtors. If we don't allow the others to repent, if we don't give them the opportunity to repent, then our repentance with our father is in jeopardy. If we hold against that person that's offended us, then our father will hold our offenses against us that we've done toward him. This is this is really the gist of what this is this is talking about here. Um, let's see, verse nine says, this act is alike both in the man and in the woman. Now they commit adultery, not only who pollute their flesh, but who also makes an image. If therefore a woman perseveres in anything of this kind and repents not, depart from her and live not with her, 
otherwise that also start to be partaker in her sin. Now, I wonder how many of you guys caught that. You see right there, it says, this act is alike both in the man and the woman. So that's what we've been talking about. You know, kind of gave Herman says the example. But notice this part. Now they commit adultery, not only who pollute their flesh, but who also make an image, who also make an image, making an image. Talking about what we see over there in the second commandment. Let's go over there. Let's let's look at that right quick. We're over here and we're looking at the second commandment. It says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. This is what this is talking about over there in the Shepherd of Armors when it says you will make an image by a, by by making an image, you are actually committing adultery. You're committing adultery by making an image. And it ain't just talking about no graven image there. You know, a lot of people want to say, well, it ain't a graven image. I ain't making a statue. I ain't making a figurine. No, it says, or, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water beneath the earth. Guys, we shouldn't be taking pictures. You know, you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, people don't like Hermes Academy because I don't show my face, you know, on here. You know, I would, if it wasn't for this commandment, I'd love to put my ugly mug right up there on your face. It makes me easier videos. I don't have to work and search for stuff for y'all to look at. You know, I can just put on a clean shirt, every, a different shirt every day. And, you know, and, and I can have, or, or even every video, I can make one video and put on a, a different outfit and make a whole nother video. And it would cut down my editing time a lot. I promise you it would, you know, it'd be much easier to do that. You know, I don't have to worry about nothing. Just put my face up on there and just talk. This makes it really more difficult to make videos like this. But, you know, it's a reason why, you know, first of all, you see this commandment here. You saw that commandment over there. You saw that command over there in Hermes that says by, by displaying my face on your screen, it makes me commit adultery. And you see over here that it's actually a commandment. I'm not allowed to take not only pictures of myself. I'm not allowed to take pictures of my kids. I can't turn this camera around and point it at all of these ducks and chickens and sheep and dogs and cats and all of this other stuff around here. I can't show you all of the trees and, you know, the, the flowers and the plants and all of that stuff. I can't show you all of the, that kind of stuff around here. Um, on New Moon Day, I can't turn my camera around and show you the moon and all of this kind of stuff i can't show you you know it's, it's it's because of this commandment over here you know i'm not you know that shy you know i used to take pictures you know i just realized that you know i was in error and i stopped but notice this part right here is notice this commandment here you know a lot of people gonna choke on this you know i really like my pictures and they got a wallet full of baby pictures or whatever they want to whip them out and they got camera phones this is why they give us these phones guys so we can take these pictures they, they know they're getting us in trouble that's why youtube is free if you try to go in and do some audio stuff, like if you try to do podcasts, you got to pay for that stuff. You know, if you, if you try to do like radio, you can, if you try to do blog talk radio, you got to pay for blog talk radio, but you can post stuff on YouTube free. Why? Because they know it's breaking the second commandment. They know we're getting in trouble for it. And so they're making it easy for us to just post a video after video of ourselves, you know, just getting in trouble. And they know it. That's why YouTube is free. Anybody can post anything. You can open up an account in 10 minutes and you can be posting pictures up, breaking the second commandment all day long. But I know people got problems with this, but look, look right here. Look right here in verse five, how he says, he's talking about thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. It's like, wait a minute, Lord, wait a minute, Father, you're missing a few zeros here. You're talking about thousands. You're showing thousands of people who love me. There were two million people out there in the desert when this was written. There were two million people out there. And he's talking about only a thousand of them are going to love him and keep his commandments. Well, think about it. This, this commandment is talking about taking images. How many people are going to say, you know what? I don't keep the commandments because I like taking pictures. They, they'd rather take pictures. They keep the, This is the second commandment. The first commandment was that you shall not have any other God before me. There's plenty of people that, you know, they want to worship other gods. So they're not going to keep the covenant. Well, you see down here. There's even there are people that say that they would rather take images. They will make rather make likenesses of things in heaven, as stars and clouds. They like to make um, pictures of things uh, in the earth beneath. That's trees, dogs, and people, and cats. And they would um, like to take images of things under the water, like fish and all of that. And he goes on to say, well, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thousands. You know, this is why I started this video off talking about how the kingdom of heaven is not for the many, guys. It's only for the few. Ain't nobody over there going to be taking no pictures of nobody. Nobody over there. Nobody in the kingdom of heaven. Nobody in the kingdom of God. Talking about a thousand year reign down here on the earth. You know, after the tribulation is over, after, you know, the, the trees can turn green again, the water uh, is cleared back up and, you know, stuff starting to grow and all of this kind of stuff. Nobody is going to be walking around with an iPhone 36 taking pictures of nothing. Ain't nobody going to be taking pictures of no trees, no people, no dogs. It's a serious business, guys. Serious business. Now, I bring this out so much because of how it's just in here, in here kind of like a halfway sideways comment when it says, you know, not only is it those who pollute the flesh that, you know, that's committing adultery, but it's also those who make an image that's committing adultery. And so it goes on to say that, you know, if your spouse, if your wife, your husband won't stop taking pictures, what is it say? Um, they won't get repentant of that thing. Well, 
just let you read it on your own. Let's go on verse 10. But it is therefore commanded that both the man and the woman should remain unmarried because such persons may repent. So, you know, this is this is important. And, you know, there's a lot of people who have done this. You know, a lot of the smartest women in the world have gone through this where, you know, they've had, you know, um, um, adultery in their marriage, you know, in the past, and they've gotten past that hard spot, and they, they are very grateful for it. They're very grateful because they didn't, you know, get rid of their husband. You know, the husband has matured now. He's, he, you know, he's not chasing every, you know, thing around like he used to be when he was a kid. And so she, 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 she is glad she's still in that relationship with him. Whereas, you know, you got so many other relationships that has been torn up because of that. You know, that's what this is talking about here. Um, so it's saying it should be it should remain unmarried. Nor do I in this administer any occasion for the doing of these things, but rather that whoso has offended should not offend anymore. So, you know, he's not making excuses. You know, that's what he's saying. I ain't making excuses. It's just I'm not trying to tell you guys what it is you're supposed to do after it's done, how it is you, you, you move along going forward. Don't nobody need to be, you know, thinking that they can go off and um, commit adultery because, you know, Herman said that you, you, you get one good shot at it. No, that ain't, that ain't the message here. Let's go on. Uh, verse 12 says, but for their former sins, God, who has the power of healing, will give a remedy, for he has the power of all things. Now, this is also an important message out of Hermes, is that, you know, we will be forgiven of our former sins, especially when we make it through this book and internalize this message here and, you know, get the seal of God. One of the things that we get with that seal is forgiveness of all of the things that we've done beforehand. You know, it's kind of like a baptism where everything you had done before that point is washed away and you get a clean slate. Even the sins that carry the death penalty, you know. You don't have to you you don't have to make up for those you going forward you know as as he's going to keep reiterating that through this book that you know our father has a remedy for the things that we have done people are you know they're sitting here thinking about some of the stuff that they've done in their life just understand when he's talking about a remedy he's going to forgive you of the stuff that you've done before but you know don't be thinking you can keep doing it don't do it again your punishment kind of doubles after you get that forgiveness you make that mistake it, it gets a lot worse on you all right, so it looks like we're changing paragraphs here. Let's read verse 13. I asked him again and said, Saying the Lord has thought me worthy that thou shouldest dwell with me continually. Speak a few words unto me, because I understand nothing, and my heart is hardened through my foreign conversations, and open my understanding, because I am very dull and apprehend nothing at all. Um, let's go down here and see what he's about to talk about. Is he about to talk about baptism? I think he is. So what Hermes is, is talking about here, he's, he's he's recognizing the fact that, you know, he's listened to some people that didn't know what they were talking about. And many of us are guilty in this, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a, you know, bad way that we find ourselves in nowadays when, you know, we have so many conflicting, you know, conversations going on in the church. We don't know who it is that we're supposed to listen to. It's like the, the, the ones who are obeying the commandments seem to be the, the strange ones, whereas the ones who, you know, are breaking the commandments, you know, and telling us we can do so are the most popular people in the church. And so that's what, you know, Hermes is saying, okay, you know, teach me, you know, tell me, tell me what it is that I'm supposed to know because, you know, my heart is hardened by some of these former conversations that I've had. Verse 14 says, and he answered and said unto me, I am the minister of repentance and give understanding to all that repent. Does it not seem to thee to be a very wise thing to repent? Because he that does so gets great understanding. Now, this is extremely important. Repentance, guys, is extremely important. I always give the example of, you know, the, the, the child that has done wrong when you come home. You know, repentance is, is synonymous with confession, with confessing your sins. And so you, you come home from a long journey and you get there and the child, you know, runs up to you while you're out in the parking lot, gives you a big hug and a kiss and says, Daddy, I, I got to tell you, I did something wrong. And he proceeds to tell you something that he has done in error. Well, you know, that's one scenario. And then you have the other scenario where you have to go in the house and find it on your own. Well, think about the punishment schedule for them both. The one who came and told you that they did something wrong, you know, his punishment won't be so severe as the one who tried to get away with it. And, you know, that's where we are when we when we are repentant. We are confessing our sins. We are recognizing that we have done wrong and our punishment schedule won't be so bad. A lot of us actually get away with what we've done because we've shown that we are repentant of it. You know, that's important. Repentance is highly, highly, highly important. We need to make that a part of our spiritual walk. It's being repentant of everything we can think of. You know, for he is sensible that he has sinned and done wickedly in the sight of the Lord. And he remembers within himself that he has offended and repents and does no more wickedly, but does that which is good and humbles his soul and afflicts it because he has offended. You see, therefore, that repentance is great wisdom. Great wisdom, guys, is, is repentance. We, Like I said, we really need to get in the, in the habit of repenting. You know, a lot of times, you know, our conscience will do it for us. You know, we'll come out of the blue with something that we've done, an offense we've done to somebody or, you know, our father in the past. And we sit there and we meditate on that, you know, feeling kind of sorrowful for the thing that we've done. You know, that's our conscience stepping in the way. But then there's other times when we need to do it on our own. We need to try to think of, you know, things that we've done that we haven't, you know, repented of and, you know, try to get in a repentant heart because, you know, that goes away to clean all clean our slate clean away those things that we've done and you know 
on Judgment Day. If we haven't gotten that stain off of our spirit, we'll have to pay for it by way of pain. You know, repentance, repentance is one way. Pain is another. Pain is the makeup. You know, I was having a, a deep discussion with somebody the other day. Is, is repentance necessary to the salvation? And, you know, when I went into the conversation, you know, I hadn't thought about it that much. I was like, oh, I don't know. You know, let me hear your argument. But by the time I was finished, no, repentance is not necessary to the repentance is not necessary at all. You ain't got to repent. You know what I mean? You, you ain't got to be sorry for, you know, doing that thing. If you're the child, you ain't got to be sorry for, for breaking a thing. You ain't got to be sorry for stealing a thing. I got this belt over here and, you know, we're going to make reconciliation. You can, you can be sorry if you want to, and you, you know, you might not get this belt, but you know, if you sit there thinking you're going to get away with it, you know, I'm going to make reconciliation with the switch. You know, it's gonna, you ain't got to repent. That's, that's what the tribulation is for. That's what the apocalypse is for. You know, plenty of these people ain't going to bother to repent. But I promise you, by the end of, the, end of this apocalypse, reconciliation will be made for everybody down here. So, no, you ain't got to repent. Repentance is not a part of salvation. But, you know, it's a good idea. Because, you know, you, you'd rather, you, I, don't, I speak for myself, I'd rather be repentant than catch a beating. You know, I'd rather be sorry than, than you know, all them licks that I'm about to get for what I done did. You know, repentance is important. Going forward. It may not be necessary, but it is definitely a good idea. Definitely a good idea. Um, you see, therefore, that repentance is great wisdom. Great wisdom. See who repents. Let's go on. And I, and I said unto him, for this cause, sir, I inquire diligently into all things because I am a sinner and that I may know what I must do that I may live because my sins are many. So, like I said, we are all a hermit. You know, this is where we're at now. We realize, we, you know, realizing that we are a sinner. You know, now we're trying to figure out, you know, what it is that we need to do to be saved. How it is that, you know, we can go on to inherit this earth. You know, it's real easy to get caught up in the rapture, guys. It's real easy. That, that don't take much at all. Like they tell you, all you got to do is believe. Yeah, that's true. All you got to do is believe. And you you going away. Your spirit going to get um, caught up in this in the, in the, uh, in the, the the spiritual valley or whatever. You're going into the spirit world. That don't take much. But if you actually plan on surviving this tribulation, if you're trying to going on and being like the new Noahs and inheriting the earth, you know, becoming you, you want to help you know rule this planet or whatever after everybody else is gone. You know, you want to be part of two million people. It's going to take effort. It's going to take some serious effort. And that's what he's saying here is that he wants to live. You know. Not everybody wants to go away in the rapture. You know, that's that's the easy, that's the easy thing. Anybody can do that. Anybody can go away in the rapture, guys. Anyway, 17. And he said unto me, Thou shalt live if thou shalt keep these commandments. And whosoever shall hear and do these commandments shall live unto God. And notice that part again, live unto God. And I said unto him, I have even now heard from certain teachers that there is no other repentance besides that of baptism. When we go down into the water and receive the forgiveness of our sins, and that after that we must sin no more, but live in purity. Talking about baptism. Baptism is important, guys. That's what the Messiah did for us. You know, they, you know, people are talking about, you know, Jesus died for our sins, you know, even though they don't know what that means. You know, what, what does it mean when they say that the Messiah died for our sins? By him dying in that manner, he actually turned blood into water, you know, and so that now we don't have to spray blood all over the temple, the tabernacle. We don't have to sprinkle blood everywhere, the blood of sheep, you know, red blood all over everything for our purification. Because of what he did, now we get baptized and we get that purification. Um, there is no um, uh, forgiveness of sin without blood. Well, the Messiah turned that water of baptism into that blood, that purifying blood that used to be in lambs and goats and cows and stuff. Baptism is extremely important. Don't let nobody tell you that you ain't got to get baptized. You do. You know, I can take you over to, as a matter of fact, I'm going to take you over to the verse that says that. Come over here to Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believes it's not shall be damned. Baptism is necessary. Guys, um, I mean, I can, I've done classes where I've gone into detail about this baptism. Baptism is necessary. Don't let nobody tell you that you ain't got to be baptized. Because guess who it is that's telling you that you don't have to, th those people who are telling you that you don't have to be baptized, they have already been baptized. They have been baptized already. And now they will come out and they will tell you that you don't have to be. I think that's kind of messed up. You know, one of my videos, I talked about how people are setting us up. You know, these people are setting us up. You know, you, you've gotten the benefit of the baptism. And now you want to go and preach and tell people don't nobody else got to do it. No, it is necessary. Baptism is necessary. But there is a thing about uh, multiple baptisms too, guys. I believe we're going to talk about that here. But let's go on and see what it says. Um, um, that there is no other repentance besides that of baptism when we go down into the water and receive the forgiveness of our sins. And after that, we must sin no more, but live in purity. So, you know, that's what baptism does for us. You know, baptism purifies of us of our sins the same way they did when they sprinkled us with blood and stuff that's a purification of our sin you know it's important for us not to go back and get back in the same you know sins that we used to do after we get after we got baptized or we squander that baptism that's why you shouldn't baptize children because you know they don't that child doesn't recognize what you have done for them and then they go on and they they, they don't really take advantage of you know what's been given to them they don't realize the gift of forgiveness that they've gotten and they go on and they messes it up you know so you need the person being baptized really needs to understand what's going on so they can they can you know really take advantage of that gift and he said unto me thou has been 
rightly informed. Nevertheless, seeing now that inquire diligently into all things, I will manifest this also unto thee. Yet, not so as to give an occasion of sinning either to those who shall hereafter believe or to those who shall already believe in the Lord. So now he's going to divulge some secrets here about baptism. Um, we're instructed in the scripture, guys, not to tell you guys everything. You know, that's why you hear me hesitate a lot of times when I'm talking because, you know, I'm like, you know, I shouldn't be telling them everything. Some of the stuff you got to go figure out for yourself. It's better for you to figure out for yourself because I may say it in a way that, you know, um, makes you doubt what I'm saying. And then you end up, you know, saying something, you know, in error against the word of God or whatever, because you didn't believe what I told you, you know, so. And that's why you see this angel of repentance here. He's, he's being cautious when he's about to, you know, divulge some of these secrets about baptism on Hermes here. He says, for neither they who have newly believed nor who shall hereafter believe have any repentance of sins, but forgiveness of them. So notice the difference between forgiveness and repentance. And, and, and I'm hoping I don't mess this up. But during the first um, baptism, you're, you are, you get um, forgiveness or repentance. I don't want to mess it up. So I'm going to use the words and use the words interchangeably. One of them, you're going to get forgiveness. And in your second baptism, your third baptism, your fourth baptism, you're going to get repentance. It's a difference. For instance, when you first get baptized, you get a clean slate. It's like you've never even done this stuff before. You know, it's, it's going away. It never, like it never even happened. But then you go back and you mess that up like I did. Nobody ever explained to me the purpose of being baptized. You know, they told me I was getting baptized because I had taken communion wrong. I took communion and I wasn't baptized. So I was about to get somebody in trouble. So I needed to get baptized quick. So they dumped me in a ice you know ice bath pretty much in the winter time in the mountains of west virginia but i messed it up nobody explained to me what i was doing so i went right back and did the exact same thing as if nothing had changed for me well that in that moment i got forgiveness of sin but then later on about seven years later i ended up getting baptized again and but that time it wasn't a matter of forgiveness the stains were still there that time now it was repentance there's a difference. And so the point is, is that, you know, even if you have been baptized before and you have messed that baptism up by becoming sinning, by sinning again, you can get repentance in the next baptism. Uh, verse 21 says, but as to those who have been called to the faith and since that are fallen into gross sin, the Lord has appointed repentance because God knoweth the thoughts of all men's heart and their infirmities and a manifold weakness, uh, wickedness of the devil who is always constriving something against the servants of God and maliciously lays snares for them. So see, that's what Hermes is saying. He's saying in the first baptism, you get forgiveness of sins. But after you've you know, gotten that, you gotten that and you just kind of squandered that, now... You know, you're falling back into gross sin. Now you can't get repentance of sin. It still works in your favor, still does the same thing, you know, but repentance and forgiveness is not the same. Repentance and forgiveness is, 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 is like forgiveness is we only got to talk about it. Repentance, we actually do got to talk about it. You know, we, we got to talk about this repentance because you need to understand where your error is. Whereas forgiveness, you know, just we don't forget about it. We're going on. We're going on. Verse 22 says, uh, therefore, our merciful Lord has compassion towards his creature and appointed that repentance and gave unto me that power of it. And therefore I say unto thee, if anyone after that great and holy calling shall be tempted by the devil and sin, he has one repentance. But if he shall often sin and repent, it shall not profit such a one, for he shall hardly live unto God. Okay, so look at this. Like we're talking about multiple baptisms here, guys. And I would suggest you get baptized again. You know, I, unless you convinced you didn't got it right and you ain't, you know, going back into a sin state, you know, you, you know, take advantage of it. Do it again. You know, um, you don't have to be down at the church. You know, you don't have to, you know, a preacher don't have to do it. A minister don't have to do it. You know, you read in the last chapter of the book of Matthew, you know, where all his disciples are commanded to do it. I, I saw a video of a guy the other day. He baptized you by way of a video. Um, So, you know, <laughs> I laugh. I've never really seen that before, but, you know. Might have worked. I don't know. You work for somebody, but anyway, anybody can baptize you. You know, you, my, my most effective baptism, the one that I really feel like I got repentance, was my wife baptized me in a tub. I baptized her, we, and then she turned around and baptized me. And, you know, it was a life changing experience for both of us because we really knew what we were doing. And, like, the first times it was, for me, that was my third time being baptized. And for her, it was her fourth, I believe. But, you know, neither one of us knew what we were doing the first three times. Nobody explained to us. Nobody told us, you know, they just pretty much put us in some water, you know, didn't tell us what was going on. But that third time, you know, it was it wasn't a preacher man that told us to be baptized. It was actually our father in heaven that put it on my heart that we should do that. He talked to me directly about it. And, you know, we went and did it and it really made a difference. So my point is, is that, you know, baptize your wife, have your wife to baptize you, baptize your children, have your children to baptize you. The, the, the power is in the water, not in the man, not in the church. You know, it's in the water. See, that's what he's talking about here when he says there's only one repentance. Because like I said, I had been baptized three, two times before that. And neither one of those times did I have a repentant heart. I didn't know I had, I didn't know that was, you know, part of the deal, you know. But it was the third time that I had a repentant heart. So even though I had been baptized twice before, it was the third time that I got repentance. And that's what Hermes is saying here, um, that you would get one time to repent, you know. And even after that time, if I went and did wrong, 
you know, and all that meant was that repentance didn't stuck, and it wasn't a real repentance. Once you repent one time, it's over. You know, you don't keep repenting. You know, that that's that's saying I'm sorry and saying I'm re I repent is two different things. You know, if you keep repenting, that's not repentance. That's just saying you're sorry. You know, I'm sorry I did that, but you know, are you gonna do it again? Yeah, I'm probably gonna do it again, and I'm probably gonna say I'm sorry again. That ain't the same as repentance. But anyway, let's go on. And I said, Sir, I am restored again to life since I have thus diligently hearkened to these commands. For I perceive that if I shall not hereafter add any more to my sins, I shall be saved. Yeah. So, and it's true. Well, Sir Herman says, you know, he's being taught by one of the best here is that, you know, if you go on and not commit any sins, we've all committed sins. A lot of us have committed deadly sins, sins that, you know, um, sins that, you know, carry the death penalty. Some sins carry the death penalty, like adultery carries the death penalty. Uh, breaking the Sabbath day carries the death penalty. Um, not all sins do, but there's some. And, but the thing is, you know, once we get this, once we get this repentant heart, then, you know, we could go on as if, you know, as if, you know, and still have a chance to make it into the kingdom of heaven. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, you hear, um, in the Old Testament, it says, you know, a person's supposed to die for this and a person's supposed to die for that. And then when you look around, you say, well, I see plenty of people committing these sins and I don't see any of them that's actually dying for that. Well, guess what? That's what the apocalypse is about. That's why you're going to have all of these people who are seeming like they've been um, targeted for no reason. Like, like you know, like this person was just minding their own business and all of a sudden this horrible thing happened to them. Well, you know, that's that's what the Bible, it didn't say, just like, you know, Adam and Eve back there. It didn't say he was going to die immediately. It just said he was going to die. You know, that's why that's what, you know, Satan tricking, you tricking us too. You know, thinking we're getting, getting away with stuff. We ain't getting away with stuff. This apocalypse train is headed straight for us. And he said, thou shalt be saved. And so shalt all others, as many as shall observe these commandments. All right, let's look at verse 25. And again, I said unto him, Sir, seeing thou hearest me patiently, show me yet one thing more. Tell me, said he, what is it? And, you know, Hermes is, you know, he's pretty wise taking advantage of this teacher he's got here. Verse 26. And I said, if a husband or a wife die and the party which survives marry again, does he sin in doing so? He that marries, said he, sins not. However, howbeit, if he shall remain single, he shall thereby gain to himself a great honor before the Lord. A great honor before the Lord if he were to remain single. Because, you know, you remember over in, in, in the scripture, Paul told us, you know, it was better to be single. You know, so if, you know, we lose our spouse or whatever, it's better for us to 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 be single than to try to go off and to marry. Because, you know, they, you, you pretty much got to start all over, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, you finally gotten a spouse that loves the Lord as much as you do. And then all of a sudden they have to go away. You know, now you're going to go get some little teeny bopper and you pretty much got to start over. You know, it's, it's better off if you, if you stay single, you know, anyway, keep therefore that chastity and modesty and that shall live unto God. Observe from henceforth those things which I speak unto thee and command thee to observe for the time that I have been delivered unto thee and dwell in thy house. So I would advise you guys again to go over and read these book, this book, you know, read this stuff, you know, um, often, you know, we really need to make this a part of our life. If we're planning on living, you know, unto, uh, unto God, if we're planning on living in the kingdom of heaven, you know, this, this, this is necessary. Everybody's going to be like this when we get over there, you know, no, there ain't going to be no wickedness left on the planet. You know, all that stuff is going away. That's what you see going on out there in the world these days. You know, we're just in the, in, in the, in the beginning battles, you know, it's about to start ramping up. Verse 28, so shall thy former sins be forgiven if thou shalt keep these commandments and in like manner shalt Alt others be forgiven who shall observe these commandments so again so here it is at the end of this chapter and it's telling us the benefits of doing what we've heard here we've we've learned in this one um talking all about adultery and it should have mentioned baptism up there um because it's a lot to do with baptism but it's talking about what it's saying is if we was to actually obey these commands and you know um not commit adultery not take pictures you know, forgive those who commit offenses against us get baptized again this time with a repentant heart he says if thou shalt keep these commandments in like manner shout out all the others be forgiven who shall observe these commandments you know, so this is the way to be forgiven all right and i guess the biggest point about that you know if we want to be forgiven we have to forgive others and then that baptism plays in a big part of that all right so i think i'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up here next time we're going to talk about um sadness of heart and patience man this is some important stuff here guys um and then once we get down into this uh chapter um i think it's five or chapter six where it's talking about how um Everybody has two angels with them. This is some deep stuff, guys. We'll cover this in another class. All right, so if you got something out of this one, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way. And it's long.